Hey, everybody, and welcome to the last episode of the year of Ask an Educator Sophia Speaks Special Edition. I am just so excited to have this last conversation with you of the year. Can you believe that 2023 is heading towards an end? I can't even believe it. Yo no puedo creer, but it's true. And I would just like to take a moment and thank Latinx Education Collaborative for allowing myself, Sophia, Sophia Speaks, to come on and just be a guest host for so many episodes in 2023. Listen, it has been an honor. It has been a privilege. And it has been such an adventure to be able to choose and select some of my most favorite people from all over the country that I admire, look up to, and that I feel their stories should be heard. And so thank you. Un gran abrazo. Tengo un gran amor por ti, Latinx Education Collaborative, which is doing an incredible job in Kansas City amplifying the Latinx voice in the K through 12 space and making sure that the Latino educator is seen and heard and valued. And listen, you even had this Latina educator all the way from the city of Chicago feeling loved. And so you have definitely lived up to your name and some of your core values of heart, community, and amplification of those Latinx voices because indeed, representation matters. So listen, up next is my next guest, my last guest of 2023. And I'm just so excited to have her on the airwaves. She is an educational leader. She is a published author. She is a founder of a publishing company. She is a speaker. She is a disruptor. She is so many things, and I'm just so excited to have her, and I am thrilled to just amplify her story. And so without further ado, I'm going to bring Ms. Rica Castillo Crawford to the stage. How are you, mi amiga? Hola, amiga. Muy bien. Gracias. I'm doing excellent. You know, it's gotten a little chilly out here in the Midwest, uh, but... Other than that, I am surviving. I always tell people, though, like I'm from South, South America. Like, this is not permissible. <laughs> this weather is not okay. <laughs> I know you just really moved to Wisconsin, right? Yeah, it's been about a year and two months, but you know who's counting? Um, I moved from Atlanta, Atlanta Metro. I got you. I got you. That's just so exciting, though. And we're just so excited to have you here. And um, just to hear from you. We already got some comments coming in. Um, this is my former student. Destiny is saying hello to you, Miss Nuri. Hey, Destiny. <laughs> She's such a sweetheart and, a, and such a big fan. But listen, uh, I spoke a little bit about you, but let's start off the conversation. Like, tell us a little bit about yourself, where you're from, what's your cultural landscape, what is your cultura, who are your people? Yeah, so, you know, I hate to take it all the way back, but, you know, I am from Peru, South America. I emigrated to the U.S. when I was about 11. Peru is a most oh, wonderful sorry. country, uh, internationally known for its cuisine. Um, culture is rich. Uh, mi gente is uh, proud, uh, but humble, and uh, definitely... Uh, I feel like from early beginnings, uh, it's been instilled in me to be proud of who I am um, and where I come from. Uh, our roots, I mean a lot to us and our culture means everything. everything. I love that. And just to be so proud of where, where, where you come from. And I know that that has a lot to do with the work that you're not pushing. And we'll get into it because I'm so excited to speak to someone that really amplifies the idea that bilingualism is our superpower and that to learn and to think and to exist with two languages or more swirling in your head is powerful, yeah. magical. So we'll definitely get into that. But tell us more about like your professional journey. 
Um, tell us what that looked like for you. Cause I know just if anybody looks at your LinkedIn, let me just let the people know that Miss Lily <laughs> got over 20,000 followers on LinkedIn. <laughs> I ain't even mad. I'm excited <laughs> because if you're winning, I'm winning and we're winning That's together right. as a Latinidad. Yeah. We're just so sought after and a rising Hispanic star and all of these different accolades um, that I am just so happy for you. Tell us about your professional journey and who can you credit? Yeah. So first of all, yes, I agree with you a thousand percent because if my light shines and I help your light shine, it doesn't take anything away from me. I, and as a matter of fact, I think it helped me shine just a little bit inside you know it helps me feel better it makes you feel good that i can help somebody else shine just as bright or way brighter than me um so it makes me happy so yeah so i feel like i've always been a teacher at heart like i mm -hmm. out of all the titles i've ever had being a teacher is definitely my top my type my top title uh, or maybe simultaneously with being a mom uh, but I wanted to be a teacher when I was living in Peru, you know, in El Cerro, in the backyard where all you saw was, you know, Cerro dirt. And um, mm. and I used to try to, you know, my sister says boss the kids around, but I used to be their teacher and try to tell them, you know, what to do and, and teach them little things here and there. So when I came to this country, that didn't change. And so I, I went to uh florida a m university which is an hbcu in tallahassee florida and earned mm -hmm. my both my bachelor's and my master's there i i love famu uh and so definitely very supportive helped me uh basically have a culmination of my upbringing and gave me that additional support and reiterating that culture did matter that my roots were important um, and that I had to be proud of who I was, right? And so I feel like all of that definitely helped shape who I am. So I was a teacher and shortly thereafter, um, I started being uh, more of a support staff in, in terms of helping implement new programs uh, for students that were uh, what we say needed additional support to meet their academic goals. Mm -hmm. um, and then went into being um, a school administrator uh, and then a director um, of academic support in Gwinnett County Public Schools. And currently I'm an executive director here in the Madison area. And I lead uh, over 16 programs with, with alternative education and, and innovation and very proud of the work that I'm doing and not only in terms of amplifying and i've only been here about a little bit over a year we've already you know created different programs and expanded our reach for our students to support them and and help them understand that alternative education um, has a different meaning it's more about the meaning of options how do we what kind of options can i provide for you to help you be successful and your success doesn't have to look like anybody else's uh, in addition to that, I'm very proud that we've been able to expand opportunities for our students who have limited English proficiency mm. um, as they come in in high school level. Um, definitely wanted to make sure that we were not forgetting them. Um, and you're right. All of my work definitely is dri driven by my own experiences and my journey um, as, an, as an immigrant, as a Latina, as a firstborn child and wanting to be the adult that I needed when I was growing up. So I don't sit here and, you know, complain and think about like, oh, they didn't do this or they, you know, they didn't believe in me, et cetera. And I have countless of stories of people in positions that should have believed in me, that should have been empowering me, advocating for me and did the complete opposite. But instead of living in that space of negativity and they could have, should have, would have, mm. I, I hold myself accountable, accountable to being the person that I should be, that I need to be because our children deserve for us to be there for them and for us to guide them and empower them every single day and for, for help the, helping them see the strengths that perhaps they haven't been able to find themselves. Wow, that's so powerful. And to be able to use that as fuel that drives you even now is um, something to be admired. But talk to us about being in school leadership, especially at that high level. I mean, I could speak from a teacher's perspective and as a teacher leader, but it's a different hat to wear. Um, leading programs, leading adults, 
yeah. really looking at these expectations and all the while through an equity lens and really being an advocate specifically for the Latino community. Talk to us about some of your experiences with that. Yeah, so I feel like in any position of leadership, whether you are, regardless of your role or title, right? right. Whether you're a teacher or a teacher assistant, it really, titles really don't make who you are. Um, that's another conversation, but re building relationships, right? A leader doesn't manage people. A leader is tasked with inspiring and motivating um, and mm -hmm. helping the people that work under them believe in the vision. And some people are just like, like the real world or outside world, people will jump on and believe your mission, your vision, your objectives, etc. And there are some people that because of lack of trust, because of lack of or, or varied experiences with leadership in the past that, you know, we all carry who, who, our experiences and knowledge. So no judgment for them. It takes a little longer. So my job is not so much to to judge people for not, you know, getting jumping on the bandwagon, et cetera. My job is to to start being innovative, right? Start being mm. creative. And how do I build relationships? How do I get to know someone yeah. so that they can believe in the vision and the mission that I have for this department? Uh, so I feel like those things are definitely very important is building those positive relationships. And like I said, it's not always easy. Uh, but it's the job that you're tasked to do. And then I'm very data driven and research based, right? Mm -hmm. I don't, I don't want to make decisions that are not data driven. Um, and we have to set goals. Uh, I'm like the queen of five year strategic planning for whatever we do. Um, even with our pilot programs, um, we have to know where we're going so that we can monitor if, to see if we're on the right path. Mm -hmm. So for me, data, it means that we are monitoring what doesn't get monitored doesn't get done so data helps me monitor and we have doc meetings and we with strategic planning you hold people people are put on the plan who is accountable for this task and we're able to come back and meet and discuss etc and research is so important whether it's local research from the school district or national research it helps us you know create strategies and implement strategies that have been proven to work with similar school districts or similar populations. And so for me, all of that networking and connecting with others uh, and learning strategies that are best uh, used is very, also very important in, in my role. Wow. There's so much to unpack there. I mean, here's a question that I have that I'm very curious about, because again, I have the teacher lens, right? And so what does the DEI movement look like from a leadership perspective, from a school leadership perspective, because many of us that are in these trenches, right, as teacher leaders and as advocates, we're really pushing for more diversity in this teacher workforce. We're really pushing for inclusion. We're really pushing for these equity, culturally responsive practices. Yeah. Like how hard is it from the top to really push some of these issues um, throughout the world of education? Yeah, so I think one of the, the the fastest ways to address that would be to be very strategic on who your team is, right? Mm -hmm. And for me, that's important. And so in my team, I'll pick on them. You know, we have, I, we have everyone from every um, ethnicity and race, um, and we have um, LGBTQ. Um, so we have representation and that matters, right? And we, we are, we meet once a week and, and we pause and we look at, at students and, you know, we look at the data, who's needing extra support, what extra support we're giving the student. Is it culturally relevant? Um, and when you have a space where you feel seen, heard and respected, then you are free to have those conversations and many times but just this this week alone we've had meetings and conversations where team members in my leadership team have literally said you know i love this because it's like it's there's no there's no stress in the air like we can mm -hmm. actually talk mm -hmm. and yeah because i i don't you know i always tell people i'm not a tyrant i'm not going to sit here and be like, it's my way or the highway. That's, that's right. not how it works. You know, you're supposed to surround yourself with people that are smarter than you. And if people have positions of leadership, then you have to trust that they are, they know what they're doing 
and they're coming from a place that's going to help the um, department grow. And so for me, that's very important, making sure that people, my, my people, my team knows that I trust them and that they are valued um, in the, the area of expertise that they have. I can't possibly be an expert at everything. And so I count on them. I rely on them. I ensure that they have professional learning. I ensure that that their voice is amplified and that when they give feedback uh, and, and or suggestions, I, I genuinely consider and I genuinely um, advocate for that because I want everybody's voice um, to be a representation of our, our department. I love that. And to have healthy school leadership is to have a healthy ecosystem at the building level. And it is so necessary, so mandatory, and also to have representation at the leadership level as well, because we know that there's a deficit there. But yes. you have such a passion. And I, you know, this is where I first caught wind of you in like this whole bilingualism um, authorship and just your deep desire to create literary opportunities and representation. Tell us about this whole journey. Like, I want to know, like, about Ten Ten Publishing. I want to know. Tell the people about your bookstore that recently opened. It's just such yes. a beautiful depiction of like a Latina leader, woman activista, like really living on purpose and really yes. taking bold risks for the sake of equal education opportunity, uh, access to literature that is just inundated with cultura. Tell us about that. Please tell us. Tell us yeah. about your book, your, your publisher, your bookstore. I'm just so fascinated by it. Yeah. So I'll be honest with you. I mean, I've always been an avid reader. Um, I feel like because of the financial means that we had when we moved to this country, one of the only places and because on Thursday evenings, I had to help my mom clean house offices. Mm -hmm. And on Saturday mornings, I had to help clean houses with my mom. And so after I finished cleaning houses on Saturdays, my mom and dad would let me because my dad is very strict, you know, um, but he let me go to the library. And so then even though my English was very limited and there were no Spanish books and no books that, of children or anyone that looked like me, I love, I wanted to read and I love to read because I was successful academically in Peru and I wanted to just keep going. So I would literally spend my whole afternoon at the public library, the librarian there after a while started bringing me animal crackers in the little old school Ziploc bag. And I don't know if she thought like they just forgot about her here forever or what. Eventually she realized and she started actually helping me try to learn and stuff. Anyway, really great experience. I've always been a huge advocate of the public library. I feel like it's really underused and we don't advocate for it and champion for the public library as much as we should. I always support, and even though when I was in Georgia, I was very involved in the public library there, and I am here too. I came here, that was one of the first things I wanted to get connected to, so I'm in committees there helping with the representation, and I do uh, monthly Saturday bilingual story times with activities here at the library. Wow. So I do that too. But anyway, back to being an author, I, even though I love books and I'm like a super fan of literature, I never wanted to be an author. That had wow. never been on my plans. I never said, one day I'm going to write a book. Totally would not, never cross my mind, to be honest with you. But without naming names, there came a time where this man decided he was going to run for presidency. Mm -hmm. And his message um, and narrative across who an immigrant was blew me away. And I really wondered and pondered and was so perplexed, like, who is this individual talking about? No mi tia Rosita, wow. no my mom and dad. Like they sacrificed everything and anything, little or big, that they ever had to make sure that I had food on the table. They loved on me. I didn't know I was poor until like way into college years. Um, wow. I just, my parents gave me the safest environment, loving environment, showed me work hard, go to school, you know, et cetera. And so I, the, the definition of an immigrant that I had mm. as an immigrant 
with the definition of this man who became our president did not correlate. I did not understand it. I was very confused and, and I didn't know, but eventually I realized I was actually angry about it. I was like, mm. you know, yes, the de donde viene? Like, what does he think he's doing? Like, that is just insane. And so one day I actually asked my sons, I was like, like, do you hear him? And they're like, oh, he's not talking about you, mom. I said, I'm an immigrant. Maybe I've done uh, a bad job, but you know, I'm an immigrant, right? <laughs> like, and they're like, okay, mom, like the poor kids, you know, they probably got scared. Like, okay, mom. But that night I couldn't go to sleep. And I thought like, how dare someone try to classify us that way? How dare someone like throw dirt on my dad's sacrifices and everything mm. he had to do like that is it just was so upsetting to me. I took it so personally, to be honest wow. with you. And so fast, you know, long story short, I decided I'm going to write a story about my family, how we came and, you know, tell the real story of an immigrant. And even if no one ever reads it, even if no one ever opens this book and buys it and reads it or whatever, I'm going to have it and I'm going to get it published so that when I'm long gone and my great, great, great grandkids want to know how we got here and what was life here when we got here, they'll read it and they'll know how proud we were. They know how hardworking we were. They know all the sacrifices that Abuelita and, and Abuelito made. Like I wanted them to know that how scared we were. Wow. And how hard I wanted to do good in school mm. and how my little sister was crying and people didn't understand her and I had to be her protector mm. and all of those things. I wanted them, I wanted, like I said, long after I'm gone, I want them to know that we are proud people and we are not, you know, doing crime and, and selling drugs. We're not doing any of that. We are right. proud, hardworking people. And we contribute to this country and we have to be proud about that. And so wrote the book. Uh, I met with some publishers and they told me in my face in the nicest way possible that Latino families do not buy books. Wow. And that bilingual books are not going to sell. And so um, gave me suggestions about the story. They didn't hate the story. They thought it was fine. They were like, maybe, yeah, I think we can work with it. And I didn't love some of the suggestions. They wanted to change the title of the book. They wanted to make the girl a little lighter. And I was like, eh, I don't know. I don't love it. And met with a literary attorney. Uh, he said, actually, that's more than generous. Nobody knows you. You're not like this famous writer. This is a general contract. And once you hand it over, it, it's their property. So this actually is not a bad deal for you. Mm. And I thought, well, how, and I asked him, I said, what happens if I have my own publishing house? And he, was, he started laughing. He said, you have your own publishing house? And I said, yeah, can I have my own publishing house? And then I could publish my book the way I want it to. And he was like, yeah, he said, you could do that. And I said, what do I need? And he said, money. And I was like, oh, okay. So fast forward again, 1010 Publishing came to fruition. And my, the first book release was my first book, 3,585 Miles to Be an American Girl. Wow. And it is literally the journey of me coming to this country. Every book starts with the challenges, right? We know I don't shy away from that. But right. at the end, it ends with empowerment. That I am proud of. I'm proud to be a, a brown girl with long black hair, that I speak English and Spanish, et cetera, et cetera. So... Um, so yeah, so then slowly but surely, we've been adding different authors and helping others feel empowered with their stories and their journeys and helping them celebrate, right? That they are, that their stories are now out here for the world to see. Uh, and so, yeah, I love that. Um, and then a couple of years ago, it's about two and a half years ago, I was doing some consulting with a mall owner and the mall is located in a very, um, yeah, a, a very Latino community. Um, most of the people there are Latino and um, we were talking about different things and I wanted him to incorporate something about education in every event he had. Mm. Um, and I was like, 
I, if you could just do this, this would be great. You know, like just mention a reading tip, some of the gifts you give away, could they be books? <laughs> like I was just trying to, you know, and he was amazing. He was great. And, and then uh, as we were walking through the mall who, that had over 200, 220 stores, I said, you have everything here. You have everything here from working wow. books to cowboy hats, but you don't have a single book. You don't have a single bookstore. I mean, I mean, where, where the kids book. find books? I said, and I just don't. He was like, oh, he said, you know, we just rent the spaces. People bring what they want to bring and to sell. And I said, you know, I said, when you go to any other community and, and you go to their malls, the regular American malls, et cetera, there's always a Barnes and Nobles. There's always a little mom and pop shop bookstore. And so seeing a bookstore and being surrounded by books is normal to many children. They have them all in their house. They have them at school. They have them in their shopping plazas and the malls, et cetera. I said, and I want that for our kids. I, even if they don't buy a single book, I want our kids to run, walk in the mall with their parents as they're going to go to the food court and be like, oh, there's the books. Like, I just want, I said, even if I never sell a book, I just want it to be there. I just want representation. I want that to be the norm for them mm. to see that books are just part of life. Yeah. And he was like, well, then you should open a bookstore. And I was like, I have a job, but no gracias. So no gracias. And, but you know, uh, the stars aligned and we opened up the little book spot, a multicultural bookstore. It's such a community. Uh, it was a community goal because moms that didn't, you know, necessarily have the money to contribute. Otherwise, I remember a mom said, you know, maestra, I clean houses and one of the ladies has a lot of furniture in her garage. I'm going to the little tables that you want. Cause I started posting on social media, like, Hey, I need three of these tables. I yeah. need bookshelves. I need all of this. And I said, Oh yeah. And she was like, I'm going to ask her. And then you can sand it in peace. And I was like, and so that's how we got all of our furniture and we sanded them all wow. down. We like literally met at the space. The moms came, the dads came, the dads came and hung up books, sh bookshelves and moms helped me paint the furniture white and, beautiful like it was it's a community it's a community wow. love and um little by little we've had sponsors so even if we don't necessarily sell too many books to you know everyday customers we have events free literacy events that are sponsored and we give away the books like a sponsor wow. will say this is how much money i'm going to give you how many books can you give to kids with this much money and i tell them and they're like okay cool like this is what we're going to do and so that's how we do it, you know, and we have authors come out and talk to the kids and we have activities and it's just, to me, it's just an, you know, a part of loving the community. And even if we make a tiny little seed of, or a ripple, a little tiny ripple of a change, I'm going to be happy with it because really my only goal, to be honest with you, was just to have presence wow. just for the kids to see that books are just part of life. I love that. And once I started getting into this equity work, I really started to realize how little representation there was and how that was the norm and how it shouldn't have been the exception. Yeah. Um, and, you know, that is so important for our students, for our families to be able to see themselves in stories, for them to be able to relate to what they're learning, to what they're reading. And it really creates such an opportunity for what I like to call mirrors and windows and sliding glass doors. And mm -hmm. it leads really into that whole representation. But I will say, I'm very proud that one of your main characters, her name is Sophia. Tell us about Sophia because <laughs> that's not your name. I'm just saying, okay? It Sophia so in the Greek means wisdom. Just saying. Go ahead. Who is Sophia <laughs> in your book? Because I know she's one of your protagonists, yes? Yeah, she's the main character. So the story is about me. You know, most writers write about their own journeys. Sure. But um, my mom passed away, and my mom was Sophia Esperanza de la Caridad. Wow. And so I named the main character after my mom. 
Wow. And she was a powerhouse. I mean, I always tell people, you know, she did not have the privilege to go to school after her mom passed away when she was a little girl in third grade. She had to be a maid at that little. Mm. Um, but she was the smartest woman I knew. And she was like a math whiz. I mean, she I think she could have been like a pediatrician or something. She knew all kinds of remedies. Wow. And it's just a, a brilliant, brilliant person. And um, and I feel like I fell in love with teaching children because of her. She wow. was literally the neighborhood mother for everybody. And um, and yeah, so definitely uh, I think I get a lot of my my passion and believing in children in general from her. I love that. And giving an homage, a tribute to Mama is definitely something that is going to leave quite a mark on the readers and such a legacy uh, for you and your family. But where yes. do you see this going? Um, this publisher, your authoring books, um, the bookstore. Like if you had just unlimited supply to resources, to access, to opportunity. Where could you see how this going? Yeah. So I've actually been approached about doing different locations of the bookstore because the bookstore focuses on bilingual books. So obviously, not, so books don't have to be in a bilingual format, So, but we offer like books in other languages as well. So I mean, I'm honest to say that most of the books are in are either English or Spanish. Obviously, English is still a language, and I love English too. Mm -hmm. um, but we also have books in other languages, Korean and Chinese and um, wow. Twai, um, Italian, German, uh, French. Um, and so we have smaller collections of those books, of course, but we do have them, and we try to grow those spaces too because – Genuinely, I love all children and I want all children to feel seen, heard and respected. And yes. I feel like representation is important for all children. Yes. And so, yes, I have to take care of home first and my community is home to me. But ultimately, it's a beautiful thing to support all children in their development and their self-esteem, which we know is more than half the battle in life, because, you know, if they believe that they can, then they will. That's right. um, so, and we do the same thing for Tent and Publishing too. I mean, most of the books are translated in into Spanish, um, but we have a few that uh, not a few. We have a few titles, but we have one of each so far because the company is you know about less than five years old. Uh, Chinese, Korean, and French. Wow, that is so exciting. And why the name 1010? What does that signify? Yeah, so in Peru, a 10 uh, on on a on a on a test or classwork means it's what means 100 to us yeah. in the US. Like, it, like it, the scale is from 1 to 10. And so and 10 is like awesome. And so in my mind, you know, we're like twice as awesome, so we're like exceptional. <laughs> so it's 1010. I love that. Like 10 out of 10. Yes. <laughs> I love that. I love that. Well, kudos to you. Congratulations to you. Where can our listening audience have access to 1010 Publishing and your books? Yeah. So um, it's simple 1010 Publishing. So 1010, but it's numerical. So it's 1010 Publishing.com. Uh, and then, you know, also on Facebook, uh, Instagram, Instagram, and everybody can connect with me connect on, um, I'm most active to be on, you know, cause I'm old people. So I'm most active, I would say on Facebook, I am on Instagram though. Um, and, and like Sophia said, I am on LinkedIn. <laughs> yes, that's right. We be hanging out there. Like LinkedIn, yes. is a, LinkedIn is a vibe. People need to catch on. Okay. Yes. Done. LinkedIn is such a vibe. I have really gotten to know folks and received opportunities and have offered opportunities. Me too. Right? It has been very yes. like transformative, like the power of networking yeah. and as it states, like getting LinkedIn. Um, yeah. I think it's something for folks to consider. 
But and I so love when people share yeah, like articles and stuff and research and all that. I love that too. I'm always like clicking on stuff and I'm like, oh, yes, excellent article. I need to print this out for my staff. Yes. Like, yeah, I like it. It's a, it's a, it's a good learning space. Yes. And just even keeping up to date, like what major organizations are up to, like the Department of Education. Um, you actually put me onto Alas. And yeah. so like I started following Alas, which BTW, I finally got an opportunity uh, to do a workshop for Alas. So we'll talk yes. about that later. Pero yes. por fin. I'm excited. Yes, good. So, <laughs> Yes, good. I love it. 2024 um, is going to be quite a year for all of us. Um, yeah, I'm already filling up that calendar. I'm like, geez. Yeah, <laughs> Can for we sure. just finish this year. <laughs> right. And just kind of getting those ducks in order and just getting those invites and all of the things. Um, I feel like it's going to be one of our best years yet. You know, 2023 yeah. has really brought us a mixed bag of experiences. I'm sure you can relate of, you know, highs and lows, triumphs and failures and just what the world is going through now. Yeah. Um, you know, as we're witnessing a war and still a lot of upheaval with racial tension and you really trying to close those opportunity and achievement gaps for our communities of color. So there's just so much going on, right? Yes. <laughs> But I would venture to say that, you know, that's what life's about. Life mm. is about a lot of downs and a lot mm. of regrets and mishaps and miscommunication, yeah. et cetera. So we have to learn to celebrate the little things every day, to celebrate the little wins and start yeah, throwing man. confetti, just like carry some confetti in your pocket and just boom, throw it out, you know, just like, boom, we won that, you know, whatever it is, it's, it's gotta be a little thing, but helping our kids realize that too, Re reiterating and articulating to kids that life has just by design, we mm. are going to have losses. We're going yeah. to feel, get our feelings hurt. We're going to be overlooked. Like that's just life, but we just got to keep going because then you don't know what the next day comes or, or the next opportunity is going to come your way um, and celebrate every single little, single little win and helping our kids see that I think is, is very important and it's going to be impactful for them. Um, because we don't want to make them think like that everything's perfect. And somehow I woke up like this, you know, that I'm not Beyonce. So that's not what happened. Come on <laughs> for sure. And I love that, you know, sitting in gratitude and just really being conscious of, you know, the energy that you're putting out and yes. what you're choosing to focus on, I think is critical to success. I think it's critical to happiness um to yeah. really just understand that listen there's still so much to be grateful for if only we change our perspective and our point of view i just recently came across something where rather than us focusing on triggers we focus on glimmers i don't wow. know if you across this glimmers like isn't that awesome yeah glimmers are those subtle pieces of confetti as you stated that kind of like sprinkle themselves over our lives. And if we're not conscious enough, we'll miss it. I like it. Isn't that awesome? I like it. And yes. to just watch for the glimmers and not just the triggers, right? Yeah. And, and, and not just the things that, you know, um, definitely lean into negativity and pessimism, but rather, man, look for those glimmers, man, like those small pockets in our day, uh -huh. in our journey where we're like, yo, like that was a beautiful moment. I like it. Yeah, I like that. And like that has really helped me to, to really think about perspective and to really shift because it is a mindset. And yeah. if we're not careful, we could definitely look at our lives from a lens of, man, woe is me, or man, I'm never going to get there. Or man, if I could just get to that next, right? Hey. If I could get to that next step, step that, that next stage, that next level, but, but yeah. wow, where you're at now, what, what about the blessings that are in front of us and what you've been able to accomplish? Yeah. Um, those are glimpses. The journey. Yep, the journey and the the glimmers in the journey are are definitely worth celebrating, and and we have to do a better job. I feel like somehow, um, I don't know, maybe we we have perhaps we haven't done such a good job at that because a lot of young people 
can't get past that. So that's literally another conversation, but that does concern me. And so I definitely try to reiterate that when I speak to them. Yeah, I feel that. And so with that being said, talking about students, talking about teachers and leaders, what do you think they need right now? Like as we're ending our year or the semester rather and 2023 mm-hmm. entering into that ho- holiday break. Um, what do you think students, teachers and school leaders right need right now? Yeah. So yeah. I feel like one of the be- the best resources we can provide for our stakeholders uh, and in and this, this case, case teachers, teachers and students, and students would definitely would be de- helping them with their social, emotional, mental health. Mm, um, come on. And, and as leaders, I feel like one of the things that we need to be conscientious of is when we are trying to be innovative and we are trying to be creative and, and solving, you know, uh, barriers or, or being problem solvers. Um, remembering that if we add anything to anyone's plate, we need to take something out of their plate too. Um, Because sometimes I don't think it's done on purpose, to be honest with you, uh, but I feel like sometimes we miss the mark there. And I feel like we consistently want to be problem solvers and we see a gap or we see a challenge or a barrier and we decide, oh my gosh, like, even if it's research-based, this is research-based, we could totally do this, let us pilot this or let us do this, but what are we taking away, right? What are we taking away? And for my team, I do one-on-one meetings and we literally, you get the chart paper and you get to write down um, the three, we organize it in three different ways and basically things that you have to keep, like no matter what, we have to get this done. But then also where, what are the things that perhaps we could revisit and, you know, tweak it, standardize it. What can we do to this, to this group of things or tasks? And then, and then the list of this is literally not in my, you know, in my scope. Like I don't need to be doing this yet. I find myself every day having to do this. Who can we give this to? Is it even have to be done? And so having that time with each one of my staff members, um, I think is very valuable because I do believe in trying to balance out and making sure that if we're adding something, we're taking something out too. I love that you mentioned that. And it is so critical. You know, one of the things that I want to address when I start my fellowship with the U.S. Department of Education in January is teacher trauma. And I want to discuss this idea of really prioritizing the mental health of our educators and how it can really solve an answer to some of the deficiencies and some of the challenges that our school's ecosystem is Mm -hmm. from the teacher shortage to the turnover, to the burnout, come on now to the broken pipeline. Yeah. I don't think that that's addressed enough. You know, someone that has dealt with a lot of mental health issues as an urban educator, being hit blindsided by compassion fatigue, secondary trauma, and ultimately post-traumatic stress disorder. You know, as I travel the country, I'm very open about it. And for some Mm -hmm. folks, they're like, whoa, like she's talking about all this. Yeah, I'm talking about all this because when educators are very proximate to some of these issues and when we're in zip codes that oftentimes determine our students' destinies and Mm -hmm. resources that are given, when we're inundated with gang violence, with gun violence, with poverty, I mean, how much can an educator take? How much can a student take? And it's exacerbated, obviously, research and data points to it among communities of color. And so yes. I'm so grateful that you mentioned that because it's like, man, we could, you know, be losing so many incredible educators that really care about our students, that really <laughs> want to do the work uh, because they're burnt out, because they need support because their mental health is on a decline. And for so many years, I felt like 
this is education. I just need to survive this. But right. it wasn't. It, it, it shouldn't be like that. Right. And it wasn't until I sought help for myself and got the resources that I needed um, where I was able to say like, hey, this shouldn't be acceptable and this shouldn't be normalized. Like, oh, well, this is where we choose to teach or this is a student demographic. So get over it. No, no one should get over this. No. We all should have, you know, fair access to, you know, and teaching environments not going to affect our mental health, at least in its magnitude. I agree. I agree. I mean, I, you know, I feel like we have lost a lot of teachers uh, and educators due to the lack of responsiveness or timely responsiveness to, to these concerns and issues. And I feel like teachers um, definitely have been voicing that. So it's not a secret. Um, right. So I definitely feel like that stuff, that's one of the things that we need to um, address. And I feel like some school districts are doing a way better job than others. But um, but I also feel like that the data for their teacher retention uh, and their recruitment would reflect that. Mm. Um, because I feel like the, the districts that definitely focus on ensuring that our teachers feel supported um, definitely have a better uh, retention rate and, and are not having as big of a challenge uh, recruiting um, other teachers. And my superintendent, before I left uh, Georgia, he's retired. He was the longest standing superintendent in the country for 32 years in the same wow. district. And, 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 and for me, you know, everything falls and rises under leadership, like John C. Maxwell says. Mm. And when you have consistent leadership at the very top, someone who is committed to the community and committed to the role, um, I feel like things fall in place and expectations are met. And he would tell us, and in Gwinnett County is the 11th largest school district in the nation. Wow. He would tell us there are only two types of staff in Gwinnett County Public Schools. He said, including myself, there's only two types of staff. There are teachers and there are those who support teachers. Mm. If you don't think you're on that second group, then you need to find another another district to work at. I mean, he literally was very blatant. Like he just told us, you know, and I feel like having that consistent message helped all of us stay in our lane and understand that we were only there because we were supposed to support teachers and yeah. teachers were the priority because research tells us that teachers have the highest impact on students aside from their parents. So for me, those are some of the best lessons that I learned about how not only uh, to, to do my, my job and my, my responsibilities, but to simultaneously never forget that, we were only existing in those positions to support teachers so they can do the job they're supposed to do in teaching our, our youth. So I think that that's very important. I think leadership is, um, is a huge variable in determining the success of a school district, but I think it literally does come from the very top. And, and, and I think there's so much to be said and we're nearing the end of this podcast. Maybe that should have been just like the main topic, but <laughs> I feel like, you know, just even me personally as a speaker, it's been like my social responsibility. I've been on a crusade of like mm -hmm. healing and liberatory practices for teachers and mm -hmm. leaders that are in the trenches and that need to heal so that we can get everybody's outcome. Everybody's desired outcome is what? Student success, right? Yeah. But how are we going to accomplish that? We have got to take care of the educators that you that you're mentioning are very close to these students, very proximate yes. to the teaching and learning process. And how do we do that? We need to bring in healing. We need to bring in so many best practices so yeah. that teachers can feel loved and honored and given a chance to digest right? From school shootings to COVID to racial injustice. <laughs> like yes. there's just a lot for teachers to really take in and the caring ones, man, like we, we take it to the heart, man, because yeah. that's just we how we're wired. Man, yeah. like 
this is personal. This yeah. is very personal. So thank you for mentioning that because that just like opened up Pandora's box for me. <laughs> like, <laughs> meet it. Yeah. Um, definitely one of my sermons that I've been being living all year. Um, yeah. I'm a so huge uh, proponent of that too, though. Thank you. Thank you for, for being a huge advocate as a school leader and as a district leader. We need more folks like you at the top that will continue to, you know, advocate for some of these important issues. Like we've got to break out of the mold. Like we've got to, one of my um, keynotes that um, I offered up, cause you know, as speakers, we do a lot of proposals and we apply like one of them um, is for school leaders. And my, my message title is break the mold. <laughs> Reimagine. Um, yeah. and lead with courage, you know, yes. like we have to be bold enough to understand that we can't function, you know, as, you know, as we always have, like, yeah, have to continue to evolve with the times. If not, our school system is going to struggle and going to suffer. So, um, getting off my soapbox last question, then I'm going to hit yeah. you. Fill in the blanks, and then we're going to have a little bit of fun here. Um, but with that said, uh, what's your vision for the future professionally? And if you have like like a New Year's goal that you're really aiming for? Wow. So, yeah, I don't usually do New Year's, New Year's goals, um, but I, I do think about like what are the things that I, I need to focus on uh so for me it's more about focusing on 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 how i need to grow as a person versus i don't know some people are like oh i'm gonna save ten thousand dollars or whatever i don't think about it too much like that i think about it more like what is one area of self-growth that i can accomplish mm -hmm. and and for me to be honest with you is to be a little bit more spontaneous this this, this upcoming year i'm i'm Ooh. such a planner I'm, I'm more like a plan A, B, and C. And everybody in my office will tell you and everybody in my personal life will tell you, like, if it's not on the calendar, it's just not going to happen. Uh, it's just, I'm one of those people. But I, I definitely want, I want to try to be a little bit more spontaneous. I don't know how successful I'll be, but I'm, I always, you know, the glimmer and the confetti will help me move along. Even if I just do a tiny bit, it'll, I'll be, I'll, I'll tell myself I won. Uh, <laughs> I'll tell myself, you did it. <laughs> you did something spontaneous. You're a winner. Um. Uh, professionally i'll be honest with you i would i definitely won um i do speaking as well um etc but i would like to to try to help others um gain more exposure um that's something i've been thinking about probably for the last year and a half yeah. um so i mean i don't know what that looks like to be honest with you i haven't strategic planned it or anything Mm -hmm. But um, I definitely want to continue and maybe not maybe and I want to grow 1010 Publishing. Currently, we only accept three to five submissions a year. I'd like us to go to 10 or 20. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, so that would yeah, like in terms of 1010 Publishing, that's what I want. Mm -hmm. uh, and I have some a couple other ideas for the bookstore. I want to do like pop up bilingual book um, store at other bookstores, like maybe mm. can I come to your bookstore and do an activity and do a book in Spanish? Like, mm. can we, can we connect? Can we core, you know, check calendars and see, can I come and, and help you grow your audience, bring other people in here and simultaneously help spread the word and the love and the joy of being um, bilingual and biliterate. I love it. Bilingual, biliterate, that is our superpower. And yeah. we are going to take that message. You are going to take that message far and wide. And I'm excited um, to view it and see it and be on the sidelines and hopefully one day collaborate with you. Awesome goals. Yes. Get the glimmer. Get the confetti. <laughs> yes. <Get the> spontaneous. <laughs> I love it. I love it. All right. Here I am in the podcast where a little fun with our guests um and we'll we'll kind of move like in little increments here from fill in the blanks like it's serious and then i'll do what is called a rapid fire where i'll ask you this or that you can't think about it too long um you'll you'll get the hang of it pretty 
pretty quickly. Uh, but for the fill in the blanks here, uh, fill this in for me. What I really desire for our Latino communities are. Uh, elevating voice. I want parents to elevate their voice and understand that they have power in the school system and uh, to show up at those board meetings. Yes, elevate that voice. And it's not that we need to speak for them, but just amplify those voices that they already have. I love it. Yeah. Representation matters because. Because I'm important too. And my kid, the kids that um, I am accountable and I represent and they look like me and they have similar journeys as me, they matter too. Oh my gosh, I love that. So simplistic in response, but so profound in meaning because I matter too. Ooh, I love it. What the state of education needs right now is? Innovative thinkers, problem uh, solvers, people uh, that, that want to empower other people and not just themselves. Wow. Come on. Use that power. <laughs> distribute, redistribute that power. And again, tell those people at the top, Newt, Newt, that we got to think out the box. Okay. We yes. got to continue to break that mold, be bold, be courageous, just reimagine, throw stuff away and rebuild it. Come on. Yeah. We cannot be afraid to start things over for the sake of lasting change and the most optimal impact our That's kids right. will our kids are depending on us to take those bold risks. I love it. Oh, here's the fun part. Okay. okay. Now we're on to the rapid fire. Okay. I've got a little music in the background here. Hopefully I won't glitch out. Vamos a ver. It's so fun. But I really want to hear your response to this. It's going to be super fun. Okay. So can you hear me? Let me lower it a little bit here. How about that? Can you can you hear me good? Yeah, I can hear you well. Okay. So the first category is places to explore. Okay, so you're talking about being spontaneous. Vamos a ver if I put some locations here that maybe we're going to see Nuria on LinkedIn, okay, over there in the location. <laughs> okay. All right. Puerto Rico... Oh, Panama. Puerto Rico. Yes. Dime por qué. La Isla de Encanto. <laughs> oh, La Isla del Encanto. Yes. The Enchanted Islands. That is um, the birthplace of my mother. Um, India or China? Uh, India or China? Mm, I'll say India. Uh, nice. Beautiful people, the, the, the materials they use for their garments are absolutely gorgeous. So, yeah. I could definitely testify to that being there almost three weeks. India is yeah, definitely it's gorgeous. Yeah. It's gorgeous. The food, the fabric, the people. It was amazing. So, good choice. South or Central America? South. Pues claro. Gross, pues, 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 <laughs> I want one of those panchos, okay? I want one of those Peruvian panchos. Oh, yes, I love it. Yo voy a recibir uno, okay? I'm going to manifest <laughs> that because those colors are breathtaking. Yes, they're beautiful. Okay, going into the music. Salsa or merengue? Uh, salsa, old school. Okay. All right. I see you. I see you. Okay. Let's see if you know these artists. I think you should. Carol G or Alicia Keys. I like them both. This Girl is on Fire by Carol G is literally on fire right now. So, and she's representing representing us, Colombia in the house. Oh, yeah. yeah. Wepa. I mean, she is yeah. really at the height of her career. Brilliant. Yes. Colombia. I like her though. She's humble. She's direct. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, of a lot of my friends and myself. Just definitely a lot of passion and um, she's doing her thing. I'm proud of her. I love that. All right, going into the food. Tengo un poquito de hambre, pero está bien. Um, tacos o enchiladas? Mm, now, it's got to be authentic, right? So if it's authentic, tacos. I love tacos. Aren't they the best? They're yes. versatile. You could put the lime any- cilantro. Mm, yum. <laughs> Cilantro, cebolla, cebollitas, like, yes. 
Yes, and, and if you like seafood, de pescado, yeah. de camarón, yes. Lengua. <laughs> Hasta lengua. Yeah. All right. Empanadas o tostones? Well, I like them both, but empanadas peruanas, because every country has empanadas that are different. And ours are baked. We don't fry them. Ah. And I love empanadas peruanas. peruanas. Okay. So what's your favorite filling? Uh, well, so we don't have all the fillings that other countries have. So we have pork, chicken, and beef. Wow. That's amazing. They have a little egg. They have a raisin, an olive. Mira. Yeah. Yeah. They they make yeah. aderezo de cebolla and then fill it in. Yeah. Man, that sounds amazing. It's more like a little meal, right? Like a little hot pocket meal. I mean, it, I mean, it really can be. With yeah. a side of rice or a salad. We're, yeah. like, I'm like totally happy. Yeah. Got it. Speaking of rice, arroz con gandules o arroz blanco? Oh my gosh. Well, see, in Peru, we don't have arroz con gandules, but I do love arroz con gandules. Uh, so I have to say arroz blanco because that's how I was raised. Yeah, right? I mean, arroz blanco a, a lado with habichuela o carne yeah, o algo así. Pescado yeah. frito, ají de gallina, lomo saltado. Those are all Peruvian dishes. So yeah, mm -hmm. anything with white rice, we ate it. <laughs> that sounds amazing. Okay, going into um, desserts. Tres leches o flan? Flan, a thousand times. I love flan. It's my most favorite dessert on the planet. If all my friends know, when you get to a party, they'll be like, hey, it's the flan. I flan. And I'm like, yes. <laughs> I didn't know, know like, that. <laughs> I love it. Tell me your favorite flavor. Are you like a classic flan? I'm very or? classic, and I get angry when people try to offer me anything else. <laughs> Yes. I don't know why. I, I really why like the plastic. Like if it's not broke, like you don't need to fix it. Why are you messing with it? Thank you. Why are you I'm messing with it? Me. Yes. My friends are like, choco flan is good. I'm like, I don't care. I don't want to hear it. Talk to the hand. I don't want to hear it. I just want a right. regular can. Don't mess with my flan. Agreed. <laughs> that classic flan is epic. Yeah, that's yes. a flavor that you got to look for. Okay. Yes. All right. Going into the last category here, kind of like justice themed, right? Okay. What the world needs most right now is healing or justice? And we can heal until we get justice. Woo! So I think we need to work on the justice part. Wow. That's it right here. We could just drop it right here. <laughs> drop the mic. <laughs> drop the mic. Last question. And then I'm gonna um, then I'm gonna cut you loose. What I want to offer the world first is my leadership or my love. My love, because mm. I think through my love I can lead. I love that. Stop, seriously. Ugh. And love is such a powerful force, and the absence of love is everything that we're seeing, right? Yeah. Yeah. The empathy is not there. Even with, we have an average of five to 10,000 um, immigrants crossing our borders. 90% uh, are stopped, of course, but, mm. you know, sometimes you hear conversations with people and I'm like, these are people, these are families, these are children. Like the lack of empathy is, is a sad, yeah. it makes me sad. So, so I feel we need to, Definitely be kind Definitely. and love each other as much as we can. Mm, I love that. Well, our time has come to an end. Stay backstage for me. Yuri, thank you so much for thank offering you. us your insight, telling us a little bit about your journey. We'll be looking out for 1010 Publishing. We'll be looking out for your spontaneity. And we are definitely going to keep our eyes on you in the new coming year. Thank you for your work. Thank you. Thank for you. Your commitment uh, to our communities, to equity, and to justice. So thank you, Ms. Moody. We so appreciate you. Okay. Gracias. Hasta pronto. So, wow. Honestly, like, I don't even have words right now because I've been with Sophia speak segment for a minute and to see it like coming 
to an end and a little bit of a close is something that oh but listen i just wanted to end um just sharing again just a few thoughts and just a second uh with sophia speaks so today's episode reminds us of how important it is to use your giftings, your assets, and time towards what you know you've been called to answer. And so we press, we push, and we forge ahead. What I'm learning is when you lean into your deepest wishes for the world, it will rise up and meet you and open the way. We have what our ancestors refer to as radical hope, that our tomorrow can look better than today if we keep committing to getting into some good trouble. And listen, I just wanted to pause and give a special thanks to LEC for giving me the opportunity to share the mic, to lean into the experiences of some of my closest friends, colleagues, y familia. This meant more to me than you'll ever know. And who knows? I may continue a Sophia speak something in the days ahead. And so I close with this to all my EDU justice warriors. I see you, I'm for you, and I am with you in the fight. Until next time, and keep looking for those glimmers. Keep shining. Bye, everybody. Have a great your year. Merry Christmas. Happy New Year. Oh my gosh. This is the end. Crazy, crazy. We are out. I am just so excited about everybody's future. Until next time.